Hey everyone. Hey guys. Welcome to another Travel Therapy Mentor video. Today we're going to be talking about the new SAVE uh, repayment plan and uh, repayment plans in general, student loan repayment plans for travel therapists and how this new SAVE plan will impact uh, decision making for travel therapists and choosing what to do about their student loans. Uh, there's some pretty big changes. I would say that most of them are positive, but there also are some downsides and uh, some things that travelers need to be aware of if they decide to go on this new plan. Um, so Whitney's going to introduce us, and I'm going to get this video shared in a few different groups. All right. Hey, everyone. For they, those of you that may not know us, uh, we are Whitney and Jared Kazaza, and we're both traveling physical therapists. We've been travel PTs since we were both new grads in 2015, so over eight years now um, since we first started travel therapy. For the last several years, we've been bringing you guys information, um, lots of articles and videos on various travel therapy topics. Jared is also very interested in finance. Um, he started learning a lot about finance um, really when he was younger, but definitely like right around the time that we graduated PT school, he got really into finance and also student loan planning and figuring out you know, what types of things we were gonna do with our student loans when we got out of school and how to best tackle that. I can vividly remember being on our first travel therapy contract, going on a walk or a hike, and him talking about uh, what we were gonna do about our student loans right when they first went back into repayment um, when we graduated, because I think you get that like three or six month grace period when you graduate. Um, so back then is when he started researching all this and writing about it. Um, he decided back in 2015, 2016, I guess, is when we started our blog, our first blog, and he was like, you know, not really a lot of people are talking about this kind of stuff. Um, you know, student loans and how finances relate with physical therapists and other healthcare professionals. So he started writing a lot about finance on our original blog way back in 2016. Um, shout out to those of you guys that have followed us since back then. Um, our original blog was called Fifth Wheel Physical Therapist because we were living in a fifth wheel camper at that time at the beginning of our travel therapy journey. But all of this to say that Jared has been researching and writing about this for going on eight years now. And there's been a lot of changes over the years. Um, he's you know, kind of discovered new things and different ways to strategize. Um, then as many of you guys know, in 2020, when COVID happened, um, they put a pause on student loans. So borrowers haven't had to pay on their student loans over the last three years. Um, and so for many of you guys, if you recently graduated within the last three years, you may have never had a student loan payment before. So this may all be completely new to you, which we get. Um, so for that reason, we kind of wanted to go over this topic. Um, we get questions about it all the time. And Jared has written a number of articles over the years about this, both on our Fifth Wheel Physical Therapist website as well as our Travel Therapy Mentor website. But he'd been kind of waiting the last you know, year or so as soon as they talked about like student loans maybe going back into repayment because they kept pushing it back, right? Like they kept um, pushing back the student loan pause and saying, oh, another six months, another six months, another six months. So there's just been a lot of uncertainty. Um, there does seem to be more of a clearer path. They are proposing that the student loans are gonna go back into repayment um, as of September is when the pause will end, meaning that the first payments will probably be due in October of this year, 2023. Again, we will see if that actually happens, but it does seem like that is um, the, the planned course of action. So Jared just recently wrote an updated article talking about some of the current changes that have happened with student loans um, and this new um, income driven repayment plan called SAVE that the government has proposed. So today we want to kind of just do an overview for those of you guys that may be less familiar with student loan repayment options in general. We'll do an overview of like what are the different options that you have and then specifically talk a lot about the, the new save plan and who that may be right for or may not be right for. Um, again, I do wanna indicate that we are both physical therapists. We don't have a finance background um, or degree. However, in my opinion, Jared has done more research in the last eight years than he ever would have. Uh, he's acquired more knowledge on his own in the last eight years than he would have if he'd gotten a degree or a certificate in finance. So he's very well versed in this area, um, but we're definitely not financial experts. So we recommend that you contact a financial expert to go over your own individual plan if you're not comfortable with figuring all this stuff out on your own. But hopefully we can give you some good insight based on all of Jerry's research. Yeah, and that will be the conclusion about all this is like, Everything has to be individualized with anything finance related, but especially student loans because everyone's situation is different. And uh, travelers, 
we, we all are kind of the same while traveling in terms of like income or very similar. Um, but then uh, the major question becomes, what do you do after traveling? And that's when you want to make sure that you made the right decision up front because some of the changes that are going into effect will make it so that it's not so easy to switch later on. So you need to, to um, have your own individual situation essentially personalized for you to make sure that you're making the right decision now and uh, that that will put you in the best position in the future. Yeah. So if anybody is tuning in live, um, we'd love if you'd say hello in the comments and let us know that you're there. I see that a few of you guys are on live. Lisa, hi Sarah, hi Alicia, hi Jenny. Thank you all for joining. I know we're doing our video at a little bit of a different time than usual. Typically in the past, we've always done our videos on Sunday evenings, um, but right now we are traveling internationally. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with us, you might know we just recently got married and we're on an, a 10 week honeymoon, honeymoon throughout Europe. Um, we're coming up on our ninth week, so we just have about a week left, but um, we're six hours ahead of the East Coast of the US, so the time frame is a little bit different today. So I know not all of you are gonna tune in live. A lot of you will probably listen later on our podcast or on YouTube. Um, so thanks if, for those of you guys that are listening later. But if you are watching live, we'd love if you'd just comment and say hi. Um, let us know who you are. Are you a PT, an OG, an SLP? Are you a student? Um, what are you thinking about your student loans? Are you planning on paying them off ASAP? Are you on an income driven repayment plan? Let us know what you're thinking. But um, let's dive into it. Okay, so talking about changes that have happened. So like Whitney said, there's been a lot of uncertainty and there was really no point in talking too much about student loans for the last few years because I think it, it was ex uh, the student loan pause was extended like seven or eight times. It just kept getting extended for three more months, three more months, three more months. Um, originally, I, I was going back through some old emails and they thought student loans were gonna go back to repayment in like September of 2020 the first time. And now here we are three years later and now they're supposed to go into repayment again. Um, the difference is that this time it definitely does look like they're actually going to go into repayment. So it makes sense to talk about these things now. Um, this new plan is kind of like the carrot that uh, the government is giving out to people that are gonna go back into repayment now. Cause you know, obviously a lot of people are gonna be upset. There's something like 40 million student loan borrowers with an average payment of over $300 a month. So it's a lot of people that are gonna to have to make a payment they haven't made for three and a half years now. And this new save plan is supposed to be a way to make it easier on people that are going to be in a tough financial position because of the, the loans restarting. And uh, I, I always assumed that when it kept getting ex extended like this, that there was gonna be some sort of thing that they, would, they were going to give out to, to ease the, the transition. And what they tried to do initially, one of the changes was they tried to do the 10,000 or 20,000 of forgiveness. And that was announced about a year ago. And it was just a couple months ago that that was struck down by the Supreme Court. They said that it was uh, not lawful, I guess, for an executive order to forgive student debt. So um, that did not happen, but that was one of the things that were gonna be like, oh, well, you know, student loans have to go back into repayment, but here's this 10,000 or 20,000 forgiveness. So that didn't work. And then now there's this new student loan plan that should ease it a little bit. And like I said, most of the changes I think are positive, but there are some downsides. So, um, yeah, and so, one... so somebody had basically asked us, um, because there's still some talk that like this may not actually go through, like they have proposed this new save plan to help ease the burden on borrowers, um, and it's definitely gonna be more lenient than they had some of their plans in the past, um, but there's no certainty that it's gonna go through. There is still a chance that it could get appealed, it could um, get struck down by the Supreme Court, we don't know. Um, now, as far as why that would be, maybe because it's so radical, maybe they might come back just like they did with the 10 to 20,000 in forgiveness and say like, no, you can't do that. Um, so we're not really sure. Hopefully it'll go through, but there is still a chance that it may not. Yeah, I would say there's a pretty good likelihood that it will be challenged in court as well. Um, just because the president was set with uh, the 10 to 20,000 forgiveness being um, gotten rid of or the Supreme Court said that wasn't legal to do. So I would say that there's a decent chance it gets challenged as well. And this is the first time that a, a plan is coming in to completely re to replace an old plan. So that's kind of a new thing. Uh, there's been several times now over the last 10 years where a new plan is introduced. That happened with pay as you earn, happened with repay, but it's just like an additional plan that people can sign up for. It, it, this is the first time that a new plan will replace an old plan, which kind of changes things. So the save plan is going to completely replace repay, revise pay as you earn. And uh, so that is kind of a, a groundbreaking change and that uh, leaves some questions about what could happen in the future with 
if potentially now programs can be completely replaced by new programs with new rules, this is a good change for, for the most part, but there could be a situation in the future where there's a bad change to a plan and it's replaced by one that's worse. So um, this change thing, I don't really like. I wish that it was just a new plan that you could sign up for in addition to the other plans that are already there. Um, that way, you know, if you already had your plan set, you just stay on it, no changes, you don't even have to think about it, but this replacing repay kind of uh, throws a wrench in some things. Yeah. So we're going to get into the weeds of that just a little bit more what that means. But just to give you a, more of an overview for those of you guys that are very confused about everything going on, um, what does this mean for you now that the student loans are going to go back into your payment? What do you need to do? Well, you need to start evaluating your own financial situation and decide which student loan repayment plan is going to be the best for you. Um, something you definitely need to do is check your mail, check your email, see if your student loan servicer has changed. A lot of them have changed. Um, mine was Great Lakes, which has now been bought by Nelnet. Um, Jared's changed as well. So you need to make sure to check your mail and your email, find out who your current loan servicer is, make sure you have an account, get logged in, look and see what your balance is, um, read some details that they have for you, and then you know go on there and once you've done some research about which plan might work best for you, you would need to go on to there and elect which plan you want to be on. Um, otherwise, they'll automatically put you on what's called the standard 10-year repayments. Or if you were already in repayment before this pause happened, you'll just go right back into whatever you were on before. Yeah. So you definitely want to, no matter what, assess your situation. Look at your plan, um, look at your student loan account, and make sure that you're in whatever plan that you think is going to be best for you. Um, so... Yeah, so you do that through your student loan servicer. If you're already on repay, then this new plan, like I said, save will replace repay. And so then when payments restart, if you were on repay prior, then you'll go directly onto the save plan now. And if you were not in repayment before this, you'll have to elect to go on the save plan if you want to do that. Or you can also elect a tenure repayment or pay as you earn or um, whatever other options are available to you. Yeah, so basically the different options that you have. Um, they have a standard 10-year repayment, which will be just your balance plus however much interest is going to accrue over 10 years divided into equal payments across 10 years. That's the typical plan that you would just go on. Um, with this plan, over 10 years, you're going to pay back your full principal and then you're going to pay a lot of interest over those 10 years. Um, but this is like the standard option that you have. Um, some people choose to pay back their student loans a lot more aggressively than 10 years because they don't want to pay as much interest. So if you think that you really want to try to pay off your student loans as quickly as possible so you won't pay as much in the long run um, by not having to pay so much interest, then some people will go ahead and just make additional payments as they go and try to get them paid off in three years or five years. We know a lot of people that have done this. For some people, if that is your goal, to pay them off as quickly as possible and save the most on interest, for some people it makes sense to do what's called refinancing. Um, now this means if you have government loans, they're going to be refinanced through a private lender at a different rate. And, and in the past, this made a lot of sense for a lot of people, but right now rates are pretty high, so for a lot of people it does not make sense to refinance. And it's important that you know that if you go on and make the decision to refinance, if you take a government loan and refinance it with a private lender, you lose a lot of the protections that government loans have. Yeah. So it's really important that you very closely assess your situation before ever refinancing your loans. Yeah, I think very few people is it going to make sense to refinance right now. Um, in the past, a lot of people's loans are like 6%, and you could refinance for 4% or 4.5%, and that made sense. Um, you might lose some protections, but you get a better interest rate. If you're planning on paying your loans off as quickly as possible, then having a lower interest rate makes sense. So that made sense. But right now, most people, if your loans are 6% or so, refinancing rates are like 7%, 6.5%, 7%, 7, 8%. So it's really hard to find a situation where your loans, you'd be able to refinance at a lower rate than your actual current rate is. So. I think refinancing right now is not going to make sense for a lot of people, but if you had private loans, there are some people that take out private loans that have a rate of 12% or something like that, like a really high rate, then maybe you'd want to refinance those loans, but leave your federal loans alone if you have those, refinance the private loans to a lower rate. So if you have private loans and you can refinance, that always makes sense. If you have federal loans, at, uh, refinance at a lower rate, that is. If you have federal loans and you can refinance at a lower rate, that sometimes makes sense, but then you have to take into account the fact that you're losing some protections like for forbearance, um, income-driven repayment plans, potential forgiveness, all of these things. So that's when it becomes more of a question of whether or not you should do it. 
But for most people right now, refinancing is not gonna make sense. And then another thing to mention with refinancing is that refinancing and consolidation are different things. Refinancing, like Whitney said, is you're taking your, your current loans and a new company is buying that debt, essentially, at a different rate. And it would only make sense that that rate's lower for you. Um, consolidation, on the other hand, is taking all of your loans that are separate, so you, most people have a different loan from each semester that you took out debt, and putting it all into one big loan at a, an average interest rate. So consolidation and refinancing are different things. Consolidation you can do inside your federal loans and still keep them as federal, keep all the protections as federal loans. Refinancing doesn't work that way. If you refinance, you're going through a, an outside company that's buying your debt, essentially. Yeah, so first of all, it's just super important to distinguish which of your loans are private loans and which of them are federal. For example, those of us that had only federal loans this whole time, we benefited from that pause, whether you didn't make payments at all or you went ahead and just paid them off without having all the extra interest, you benefited from this pause because they were federal loans. Um, I've known a lot of people over the years that for one reason or another, some life circumstance came in and they had to put their loans into forbearance temporarily, which means they temporarily paused their payments because they were going through some kind of life thing. That can only happen if, with your government loans if you have them still as federal. If you refinance them and go through a private company, you lose all those protections. So just make sure that if you go that route, it makes sense financially and you're really prepared to actually pay them off in the next like three to five years. Yep. So in general, you have standard 10 year repayment, pay them off as quickly as possible, whether you refinance or don't refinance, or the third option is income driven repayment plans, which is what we're gonna talk a lot about because a lot of people have questions about what are these income driven repayment plans? Um, what are these student loan forgiveness type plans? Um, and then within those, there's different types. Yeah, and it is confusing. And I remember like when you were saying, eight years ago we were graduating and I was going through this stuff like reading every possible resource I could find on it because there are, like I was saying earlier, they add new plans, but they usually don't take away old plans. So there, there are like, in terms of income-based repayment plans, there's like the ICR plan is income, re, income contingent repayment. There's IDR, which is basically just a, a blanket category for all the different income-based repayment plans. There's IBR, income-based repayment. There is pay-as-you-earn. There's revised pay-as-you-earn. Now there's gonna be the new save plan. And then in addition to that, there's also ex, uh, graduated extended repayment, things like that. There are just so many different options and it gets very confusing. And part of this new save plan, they wanna like funnel everyone into this new plan just to make it easier on everyone. So you're not, you don't have people that are on seven different types of income driven repayment plans, depending on what they're, uh, when they graduated, what the terms are. And the other thing with all these income driven repayment plans is they're all, they all have different terms. Some have different forgiveness terms, some have different payment terms. Um, they all have different rules, which makes it extremely confusing. So if you want to learn in more detail about some of this stuff, in addition to today's video, I would recommend that you go back and read some of Jared's articles where he wrote in detail about the different income driven repayment plan options. And the reason why we decided to go on the one that we were on before, um, which was repay and why we thought that was a really good choice for a lot of travelers. So on our fifthwheelpt.com, um, blog under the finance section. You can see there's a student loan subsection where Jared talks all about um, save, or sorry, not save, but uh, revised pays your earn, pays your earn, and the different income driven repayment plans. So long story short, after lots of research, um, Jared determined that for us and for a lot of travelers, the repay plan was one of the best ones for travelers. And that's what we've been on for the last several years. Of course, our loans have been paused, but prior to that, we were on the repay plan. Yeah. And after I went through all of the different income driven repayment plans, a lot of the newer plans that were introduced were better than the older plans. So most people were either on, before the pause, were either on pay as you earn or revised pay as you earn when it comes to income driven repayment plans. If they weren't refinancing or they weren't on 10 year repayment or doing any of those things, if they're on income based repayment plans or income driven repayment plans, it was usually pay as you earn or revised pay as you earn. The reason that we chose revised pay as you earn and the reason that I wrote so much about it and uh, kind of told a lot of travelers that they should really consider it, most people completely dismissed revised pay as you earn because to get to forgiveness, it was 25 years of payments versus 20 years of repayments on pay as you earn if you had graduate loans, which all, all the 
the therapy people, people following us have graduate loans? Not all. Well, except for assistants, Most. but a lot. You know, PTs, OTs, and SLPs are all going to have graduate loans. Yeah, so 25 years of repayment. So most people are like, oh, five extra years of repayment. I definitely don't want that one. I'll go on pay as you earn. And that, initially, that's what I thought as well. Um, the really cool thing about repay that pay as you earn didn't have is this interest subsidy, a monthly interest subsidy. And the way that it worked was whatever interest would accrue on your loan each month, if your payment wasn't high enough to pay off that accrued interest, half of that accrued amount would be forgiven. So let's say your loans were accumulating $1,000 of interest every month and your payment was only $500. That means that that extra $500, if you were on pay as you earn, that would be added to your loan balance. On revised pay as you earn, half of that amount would be subsidized automatically that month. So only 250 would be added to your loan balance. The reason that's so powerful as a traveler is because our, um, our adjusted gross income, our taxable income, your hourly income is low, which means that you can get in a situation where your payment is zero or very, very low, meaning that normally on a pay as you earn plan or any other plan, your, your balance would be growing pretty quickly because all that interest would be added to your loan. But on revised pay as you earn, half of that interest each month was automatically forgiven and only half was added to your loan, which if your payment is zero, that effectively cut your interest rate in half. And that's what a lot of people didn't understand back then about repay. And that's why um, we ended up choosing to go on that plan. And so now the question is, save is replacing repay. Is it better or is it worse? Yeah. And so I want to back up just a second because I realized that um, for those of you that this all this is new, uh, we maybe skipped over a big overview step here. So most people, when they get out of school, I think they realize this whole thing with the interest and everything, and they're like, let me pay them off as quick as possible so I don't pay more in the long run. And a lot of people get into travel therapy, and we get this question a lot. It's like, oh, did you make more money, and then you were able to pay off your student loans quicker and get rid of that debt as quick as possible? And that is conventionally what a lot of people do. A lot of people go into travel with that mindset of like, I'm going to pay off my student loans as quick as possible. And we've known many travelers that have done this and paid off their loans in like three years or less. And this was initially our plan as well. That's what I plan to do is we we're going to travel, pay off our loans as quickly as possible, and then start to invest. Yep. So a lot of you might be wondering, like, aren't these income-driven repayment plans for people that can't afford their payment or like for people that took out loans for a degree that they never used and so now they work at Starbucks and, you know, they have all this debt, right? So why would you use it as a traveler who makes a lot more money? Yeah. And the answer is it depends on how much you want to optimize and your risk tolerance and things like that. So essentially, we thought we were going to pay off ours as quickly as possible. And then I started doing some of the math on these repayment plans. Um, what I found was, okay, if I can invest this money instead, what is my likely return going to be investing, going a safe index fund, broad market approach versus what is my interest going to be accruing on these loans? So that's how I looked at it. And I, um, I looked at at this time, repay didn't exist. So I was looking at pay as you earn versus investing the money instead. Like I knew as a traveler, we could get our, our income really low. We'd have a $0 payment on a... Um, because as travelers, if you've gotten this far in traveling, you know that um, part of your pay is not taxed. So on paper, as far as your tax return looks, um, which is what Jared mentioned, your adjusted gross income, your AGI, um, what you turn into the IRS, you only put on there your taxable income. So as a traveler, only, only part of your pay is taxed. So your pay actually looks lower um, as far as the IRS is concerned and all the things that they base income-driven repayment plans on. So even though in actuality we get these stipends, we get extra money, you're making more money net than at a permanent job. But on paper, on your tax return, it looks like you make less money. Yep, okay. So I knew that we could get our AGI really low as travelers we would have a payment that was probably zero or very low. So then the question becomes, is the amount of interest accruing on your loans, can you offset that by investing instead? And, um, and there's some other considerations, but that's the big thing. And so what I looked at was, okay, our loans are accruing interest on this pay as you earn plan at about 6% per year. Average investment returns over time are eight to 10%. If we invest the money instead, it makes sense. In addition to that, there's the potential for loan forgiveness at the end, which is you know, another thing that makes going on an income-driven repayment plan uh, beneficial, or it, it's a positive in that column. And so then when the repay plan came, 
And like I mentioned earlier, that interest subsidy makes a huge difference. It, it, it effectively cuts your interest rate in half if you have a $0, $0 payment. So then um, looking at that, it's like, okay, well, our interest is going to be accruing at 3% versus investments, again, over a long term, on average return, 8 to 10%. Well, investing made a lot more sense. And then you still have that potential for forgiveness later. And that's what we decided to do. You know, it's a little bit of a risk. What if the market does drop? Um, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen with investment returns going on a historical average, but it has worked out really well for us. I, I just wrote an article that hasn't been published yet going through the calculations. And after eight years of doing this, investing instead of paying down the debt, we are, I'm ahead by over $110,000. So $110,000, my loan balance didn't even start at $110,000. And that's in terms of total net worth over this period of time investing instead of paying down the debt. So the first thing you have to think about um, with any kind of repayment plan is what is the best choice? What's the best thing to do with your money, invest or pay down debt? And then you have to look at your interest rate in the debt, how low you can get it, what's the average that you might earn investing, and, and take things from that perspective if you want to optimize your finances. Yeah. If you just want to reduce your risk, then just pay off the debt. Don't worry about any of that. But if you want to optimize things and take the highest probability route of a, a good financial outcome, then I think going on an income-driven repayment plan and investing instead can make sense. Yeah. So this can be really confusing for a lot of people. And you know, we Jared spent a lot of time debating people and talking to people about this over the years since he kind of discovered it and decided to go down this route, rabbit hole. Um, nobody was talking about this kind of stuff. Nobody was doing this kind of thing that we'd heard of. Nobody was like really using um, income-driven repayment plans as like a financial strategy <laughs> to get ahead financially. Um, so it's definitely deep in the weeds of optimizing your finances. Yep. But for a lot of people who have a lower risk tolerance, it makes more sense and it makes you feel more comfortable just to go ahead and pay off the debt. If you have the money to pay off the debt, pay it off as quickly as possible, be debt-free, and then move forward in your financial path and start more aggressively investing and trying to optimize your finances after year three or year five or however long it takes you to pay off the debt. And that's totally fine. That's definitely the safest and simplest way to go. It's only if you really want to optimize things and you're willing to take a little bit extra risk would you consider what I'm talking about. Yep. So with that said, um, if you want to learn more about like kind of that choice between paying off your student loans as quickly as possible versus optimizing by utilizing one of these income driven repayment plans as a traveler, Definitely go back and read some of Jared's early articles on that, as well as this new article about the SAVE plan. So with that said, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the SAVE plan and who that might be good for or who it may or may not be good for um, if you are somebody who's in that camp of trying to optimize your finances by using these income-driven repayment plans to your advantage. Yeah, and one other thing to mention before we get into that is you're, there's probably some people watching this that are like, well, you haven't said anything about PSLF or Public Service Loan Forgiveness yet. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. One, it doesn't really apply to travelers. You can't, you can't work for a nonprofit travel company. So anyone traveling is not going to be making progress towards public service loan forgiveness. The other thing is public service loan forgiveness, this is often confused by people, is not a plan in itself. It is a, um, it's a, a special benefit giving to people, given to people that work at nonprofits that are already on an income driven repayment plan. So if you're going to get PSLF, if that's your goal, there's some people that want to travel for say three years and then work at a nonprofit for 10 years and have their loans forgiven, you would still be on an income driven repayment plan. You'd either choose, it's going to either be pay as you earn or this new save plan that you'd go on. And then after 10 years at a nonprofit, your loans would be forgiven. So pay out PSLF, pay as you, uh, um, public service loan forgiveness in itself is not a repayment plan. It is a, a forgiveness given to public workers after they make 10 years of payments on a income driven repayment plan. Yes, yeah, so, so it's basically a feature of a one feature. of the plans if you are working at a, a nonprofit. So yes. unfortunately, even if you were a traveler, we've heard people be like, well, what if I try to only take contracts at not-for-profit hospitals? Unfortunately, when you're a traveler, you are a an employee of the staffing company, not of the hospital directly, so it won't count. Your student loan payments won't count toward PSLF because you're not working directly for the hospital system. So you might have other reasons why you want to travel for a few years to get the experience, 
you know, explore the world, make a little extra money, whatever. And then maybe when you settle down, you decide to work for 10 years at a not-for-profit hospital, and then you would benefit from the PSLF. But in the meantime, while you're a traveler, which is who this is really directed toward, is what travelers should do about their student loans, um, you, could, you can still be on one of these regular um, plans. And then later you can stay on that plan and then benefit from the PSLF aspect of that plan. Yep. Okay. So... Nothing is really changing since before COVID and before the student loan pause, except for this save plan taking the place of repay. So if you were trying to make this calculation, do it, making all these decisions before, nothing is really changing except that save is taking the place of repay. Pay as you earn is the same, tenure repayment's the same, refinancing is the same, all that's the same. So mostly we wanna focus on this change because we've made videos and written a lot of articles about the other things in the past. Um, we wanna talk about what the pros and cons of save are now versus what you know repay was before and most of them are positive i would say most of the changes are good things and i hope that this goes through and there's um you know it's not challenged and overturned and all that stuff like the other forgiveness was um but there are some changes that are a little a little concerning i would say so let's start with the positives the first positive and probably the biggest positive that most people are going to pay attention to is that payments will be lower on save versus repay and the reason being is that your payment is based on your discretionary income and it's a percentage of your discretionary income. What is your discretionary income is a multiple of the poverty line. And in the past, what that meant was they would take 150% of the poverty line for repay or for pay as you earn. And then whatever you made over 150% of the poverty line, they would multiply that by 10% to get what your payment would be for the year and then divide that by 12 to get your monthly payment. Now on save, it's going to be 100 or 225% of the federal poverty line, which means that everyone's payment that's on save is now going to be lower at the same income level as it, than it would be if you're on repay or pay as you earn. So it means when you say discretionary income, it means however much you make more than what they consider to be like the poverty line means like the essential income. So they don't count that poverty line. And before they were counting up to 150% of that, but now they're counting 225%. So basically they're saying if you're like a middle class worker making 225% above the, the poverty line, now we're only going to count anything above that. But before they were like, if you're like a lower middle class at 150% of the poverty line, we're going to count any income above that. So the poverty line is a dollar figure and um, it's pretty low. It's like, I'm not exactly sure, but it's 12 or 13,000, somewhere around there. So before they would take the, that poverty line, it changes each year based on inflation. It also changes based on your, your household size, how many kids you have, if you have a spouse, things like that. Um, so it would be that number, 12,000, 13,000, somewhere in that range for a single individual, times 150, uh, 150%, so times 1.5, which was around 18,000 or 19,000. So then any amount you earn over that, it, you multiply that by 10%. So if you made 30,000, you're 11,000 over the poverty line, you multiply that by 10%, that's uh, $1,100 a year, you divide that by 12, that gives you your monthly payment. So that's how they determine that. So now it's just that the discretionary income that they're using is gonna be higher and you're taking the poverty line, which won't change. It just changes every year based on inflation, but it's not changing for this plan and multiplying it by 2.25 or 225% instead of 150%. Which is 27,000. So anything you make above 27,000, say, it's, you, say it's, you make 50,000. I think it's actually closer to 33,000. Okay, say it's 33,000. Say you make 50,000 and they're subtracting 33,000. Now the base number for you, you make 17,000 over that. And so then they would divide that out based on yeah, and that's for grad student loans. Um, for undergrad loans, it's only 5% of that amount over 225% of the federal poverty line. And if you have both grad loans and undergrad loans, it's gonna be a weighted average of the two. So 10% is what you're paying on your grad uh, student loans of your discretionary income, and 20% or 5% uh, of your undergrad loans of your discretionary income. So that's all pretty confusing even to me but basically what it means is that your your, your payments your gonna be payments low, gonna be low no matter what because they're being more lenient on saying like well if you only make this much we're only going to make you pay this much and before they were like well you make a lot if you make more than 
50% of the population. And they're like, no, now we're going to be more lenient. Now we're going to base it off 225% of the population. Exactly. So they're being more lenient as far as your payments are going to so go. So for any given income amount, you're going to have a lower payment on save than you would have on repay. Okay, so number two, this is a really big benefit for travelers and for anyone making a low income. I talked about earlier the interest subsidy for repay, which was like a superpower for travelers. You could essentially cut your, um, your accrued interest every month in half if you had a very low payment or a zero dollar payment. Now they're going to completely get rid of any accrued interest, which is huge. So let's, for an example, let's say that you have 200,000 in loans and you're traveling, you get your payment, you get your AGI below 33,000, whatever that 225% of the poverty line. I think it's like 32.8 or something like that, 32,800. If your AGI is below that, your payment is zero. And let's say that $200,000 loan, it would normally be accruing $1,500 a month in interest. Your payment's zero, you don't pay anything. Normally that $1,500 would be added to your student loan balance at the end of the month. Well now on save, nothing will be added to your balance. So no matter how low your payment is, no matter if you are paying, are paying all of your interest accumulated each month or not, your balance will never grow. That is a, that's a crazy so it's thing. It's basically an interest-free loan. It's basically. an interest-free loan if, you're in, if your income's low. And so that means any traveler, combining the first, uh, the first benefit and the second benefit, any traveler making less than about 33,000 a year on their AGI, which is not hard to do if you're, if you're working the full year and you're contributing to retirement accounts, or if you're only working part of the year, working through your contracts or something, your, your AGI is probably not gonna be above 33,000. You'll have a $0 payment and you'll have no interest accumulating each month. So it's basically an interest-free loan as long as you travel, which is pretty crazy. That's really amazing. I'm just gonna to touch on that a little bit more for those of you that may still not understand, like why would my AGI be so low? as a traveler and why would it why would I be able to get a zero dollar payment? Jared again has written many articles about this, but for example, a lot of travel contracts you only make twenty dollars an hour taxable. Is it like a pretty typical PTOTS? Twenty level? to twenty five. Okay, so say if you made twenty dollars an hour taxable times forty hours, that's eight hundred dollars a week taxable income as a traveler. And say if you even if you worked the full fifty two weeks a year, that would only be forty one thousand dollars Forty-one six would be your AGI for the year, assuming you have no other income sources and all that. But you probably don't work 52 weeks, so you probably work 48, so it's 800 times 48. So now you're looking at 38. So you, your AGI, if you did nothing else and only worked 48 weeks of travel contracts, would be about 38,000 is how much it would look like to the IRS that you make. So now it looks like you're a person who makes $38,000 a year, but you have a $200,000 student loan balance. So now you can see, oh, this is why it looks like on paper we qualify for these income-driven repayment plans. Now, how can you further reduce your AGI? Well, if you contribute to a 401k, then that's, that's pre-tax money. So your employer, your travel company is taking out of that money out of your taxable income. So we've gotten our AGI, our taxable income down really low before by working travel contracts and contributing to a 401k. So these are the reasons why you can get your AGI low enough to qualify for these income driven repayment plans and have like a zero or like sometimes our payment was like $50 yeah, a month. Very low. Um, and very let's low say, payment. like Whitney said, let's say you made 41,000, you didn't put any money towards your um, retirement accounts or anything like that to reduce your AGI. That would mean that somewhere around, you'd have a payment of somewhere around, let's see. He's calculating it based on the power. Somewhere around one. $50 a month. It'd be like $48 a month that you would have. And so if you were accruing a thousand dollars a month of month of interest, you were paying forty-eight dollars towards that, all the rest of that interest would be forgiven and your balance wouldn't grow at all. So that's just really amazing. That's uh, extremely helpful for any traveler. Your balance on your student loans never grows and your payments low. Yeah. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about a couple of other positives, but there might be some questions already being raised in your mind as we go through this of like well, what about when I'm not traveling anymore, right? So we're gonna to get to that. Don't worry, we're gonna to get to talking about like, well, what about when I'm not traveling? But while you're traveling, that's really good. Obviously, you're basically getting an interest-free loan for all the years that you are a traveler. Yep, yep, really good. Um, another positive is that on repay, it used to be that if you were married and whether you filed jointly or separately, your total income as a married couple is what determined your student loan payment. 
It was based on your total income and your total student loan balance between the two of you. On pay as you earn, there was a thing where if you filed separately, then it didn't take into account your spouse's income. But repay, it didn't matter. If you filed separately or together, it was always taking into account both of your incomes. Now on save, it's gonna be like pay as you earn. They're getting rid of that thing on repay where if you file separately, married filing separately, um, now it doesn't take into account your spouse's income, which just simplifies things a little bit, I, I think. So for example, Whitney and I, we just got married. We're gonna file married filing separate and her income and her student loans will determine her payment. My income, my student loans will determine my payment instead of it being mixed together and determining payments that way. For a lot of people that led to higher payments on repay if you were married. So that's gonna be a benefit. You don't have to worry about that anymore. If you file separately, you just worry about your income and your debt and your spouse worries about theirs. Yeah, so that won't apply for all of you, but for some of you that may be a benefit. Yep, uh, another positive that this will not apply to many people, but it, it really will help people with undergrad loans or uh, people that went to community college and this things like that. This could be more helpful for those of you that are assistants and have a low uh, student loan balance. Yep. Um, obviously for our friends out there like us that have graduate school loans, this part may not apply. If your original loan balance was $12,000 or less, after 10 years of payments now, your loans will be forgiven. So on the normal repay, save plan, it would be 25 years of payments for forgiveness. But if you have a low balance now, they're going to forgive that quicker. So at 12 years, or at 12,000 or less, 10 years, it would be forgiven. If you have anything over 12,000, for every additional thousand, it's an additional one year of payment. So if you had 13,000 in debt, it would take 11 years to get to forgiveness. If you have 14, it would take 12 years. So that doesn't really help anyone that has more than about 26 or 27,000 in debt. You're still gonna have to do the 25 years. But anyone that has less than, let's say 25,000 in student loans originally, then your time to forgiveness will be shorter, which is a benefit. So that's another thing to mention for this plan that it has over repay or even pay as you earn. Neither one of those had that, that benefit. All right, so, so far it sounds like the save plan is gonna be awesome. And if the repay plan was a good choice for you before as a travel therapist, it's like, yeah, obviously it sounds like when it just becomes the save plan, that'll be the go-to option for me, right? But there are a couple of negatives that we do need to talk about and it especially pertains to what happens after you stop traveling. Yeah, um, and when this plan was initially proposed and I looked at what they were saying about it, I was like, man, this is crazy. This is gonna be a dream come true for travelers. Like. All of these things are great. We were talking about it's basically an interest-free loan while you're traveling. Uh, there's really, in my opinion, there's no reason to pay down your debt quickly if you can have an interest-free loan and just invest that money instead or you know, do whatever else you want with the money. Which is the conventional wisdom that a lot of people have used for a long time with like a mortgage. If you had a good mortgage rate, they would call your mortgage like good debt, right? Like they would say like, why pay down your mortgage back when they had good low rates? when you can just keep that debt and then use your money more wisely in the market to make more money, right? People always had that conventional wisdom about a low rate on mortgage, but no one was ever talking about it in terms of student loans until Jared was like, how can I hack the system? Yeah. So, you know, anyway. Yeah, so I thought all the, all the changes were positive. This is gonna be amazing for travelers. And I still think that's probably the case for the most part, but there are some negatives. Uh, the biggest negative, in my opinion, is that under this new plan, after making five years of payments on save, you won't be able to switch plans anymore. So they, you kind of get locked in and you, you might think, well, why would they do that? A big benefit of revised pay as you earn in the past, in my opinion, or any income driven repayment plan, was that you could switch freely between plans at any time and all of the payments you made on a different plan would count towards this new plan. And you might think, oh, well, why would I want to do that? I'll choose one and I'll just stay on it. Here was my plan, and here is what I'm sure a lot of other people that were like really looking into the weeds were figuring out. You could take advantage of the interest subsidy on repay all the way up to like year 19, and then you could switch to pay as you earn. And then you get forgiveness at 20 years on pay as you earn versus the 25 on repay. There was nothing stopping you from doing that. So you could get the best of both worlds because the big downside of repay was five extra years of payments but you get that interest subsidy. So most people are having to weigh that pro and con. But in the past, there was nothing stopping you from getting the interest subsidy the whole time, switching to pay as you earn right before you get to 20 years and still getting your loans forgiven at 20 years. So that was a loophole that existed that could give you the benefits of repay and the benefits of pay as you earn. And that's what, that's what we plan to do. And um, so now this new thing is, I kind of assume that loophole will be closed. And I think most people probably did. There's a lot of time between 
when when the repayment plan started and 20 years for them to change this and it's happening now um but this new plan yeah it's going to be five years of payments and then you can't switch so that's not going to be an option anymore and then on top of that after july of 2024 you'll no longer be able to go on pay as you earn at all so if you're on the save plan after july 2024 you can't really switch off of it anyway unless you're going to switch to like a 10-year repayment plan or you're going to refinance or something like that so essentially if you choose save you're stuck on save and some people that won't really be that big of a negative for me i don't like not having the optionality i don't like not being able to switch between plans you know in case our, our personal situation changed or um you know we got extremely high paying jobs or you know something changed and i wanted to switch to another plan i liked having that option and now that's not going to be an option so i would say that's probably the biggest downside um what about one other thing we didn't talk about was the new cap on the payment amount yeah um i'll talk about that in a second okay um should we talk about right now what that might look like um like is considering how long you might travel and that sort of thing or yeah so because you can't switch to pay as you earn later there there was a situation too where some travelers if they asked for my advice i would say well i can't really give you advice but i don't see a lot of downsides to be on repay while you're traveling because you can switch to pay as you earn or you can switch to whatever you want afterwards and you can take advantage of this interest subsidy so I think most travelers, it made sense. You go on repay as long as you travel. Once your income increases and maybe you don't benefit from that interest subsidy anymore, okay, then decide, do I want to go to pay as you earn or do I want to stay on repay or do I want to go to 10 year repayment? You still have the options. Well, now you won't have those options. So now you have to think about your future more since you're kind of locking yourself in now. And the question will become, well, what, what would happen if you travel for four years and then you get a permanent job where you're making 120,000 a year and your payment goes way up and now you can't switch off of this plan. And it's 25 years of forgiveness instead of 20 years on pay as you earn. Then there's situations where you could actually come out behind on save versus being on pay as you earn. So you have to really take into the account those things now and determine what is gonna be your plan after you stop traveling and does it make sense to be on save and be stuck on that until you either pay off the loans or you get to 25 years, or does it make sense to go on pay as you earn now and completely surpass or give up all these benefits that we already mentioned to, to be on that 20 year plan instead of the 25 years of forgiveness. So that's something that you have to consider now you didn't have to consider in the past. Yeah, and we're gonna talk more about like what we think, what, what our plan is and that sort of thing, and maybe some scenarios. But this is where it's important to mention um, Jared did all this stuff on his own, trying to figure it out, um, making spreadsheets and running calculations and doing all these things. In the meantime, a couple of years after he had sat there and did all that with Excel and everything, um, our friend Joe Renke created Fitbox and Fitbox now does a lot of this for you. Um, so we highly recommend that if you're trying to make these decisions to optimize your finances, go with Fitbox and just use the tools that they have to help run these scenarios for you and decide what's a good decision for you in the long run. Um, again, for a lot of you, it's gonna make just a lot of sense just to pay it off. But if some of you are trying to optimize your finances and things and you wanna see what you can do right now while you're a traveler versus later, Joe at Fitbox can help you run a lot of those scenarios. So we highly recommend that. Okay, so like when you just mentioned earlier was the payment cap. And this is more applicable now. So this payment cap didn't, okay. Let me go back there on pay as you earn there is a feature where if your payment gets too high let's say your income is extremely high let's say you you become like a vice president of a, a pt company and suddenly you're making four hundred thousand a year your payment would still be capped at whatever it would have been on the 10-year standard repayment plan repay didn't have that feature so if you're making four hundred thousand a year suddenly your payment might be three thousand a month instead of on the 10-year repayment plan it might have been a thousand dollars and that's where it would have stopped on pay as you earn repay there's no cap if your income's high it just keeps going up um, most people that will probably never be a real big issue but you never know in the future like you might you might start a company you might move way up in the company you're in you don't know what's going to happen when you take a permanent job so not having that cap could be a big deal and that remains on save so there's no cap on payments on save whereas on pay as you earn there is a cap on payments so something else to consider because 25 years is a very long time and you don't know what your earning situation might be in the future 
So if you're someone that's planning on traveling for a few years, working a permanent job until retirement age, there might be a situation where you're earning a lot of money at some point in the future. If you're on this income driven repayment plan, now suddenly your payment is higher than it would have been even on a 10 year repayment. And uh, you know that might not be an optimal scenario for you. So something else to take into account is just a lot of things that can happen between now and 25 years from now um, to that forgiveness. And if you can't switch plans, then you really have to think more about the future now than you did in the past. So in that case, if it was somebody who was planning on traveling, which a lot of travelers only travel for between one and five years, um, I would say the average is like two to, two to three years. Um, if you were a typical traveler who was going to travel less than five years and then planned to probably just pursue a regular job until typical retirement age, would it make the most sense to do with pay as you earn? It just depends. It depends on how much you think you're going to make because let's say, I mean, a lot of people transition to part-time or they transition to PRN or something where they're not working as many hours and then their income doesn't really go up that much with a permanent job compared to what they were making when they were traveling. Um, us, for example, we went from traveling to working fewer contracts to working part-time PRN. Our income never really went really high as therapists. So for us, it wouldn't really make a difference. Like save makes a lot of sense. We would have a low payment for the whole length of the, of the um, repayment plan. Right, so that would be the case for a different person in a different scenario where they think they're gonna pursue financial independence, semi-retirement like us. But for a person who thinks that they're probably gonna have a pretty typical career, they're not aggressively trying to save for early retirement. Yeah, you have to run the numbers. There's, there's no way to know. I mean, because some permanent jobs are gonna make 70, some you'll make 120. So if you're making 70 and you're contributing to retirement accounts and you get your AGI down to like 50,000, your payment's still gonna be low, that's great. So probably save makes sense for you. If you're making 120,000, you're living in an expensive cost of living area and you can't contribute too much to your, save, or to your um, retirement accounts, well now your AGI is 120,000 and your payment might be 1,000 a month and that will change the calculation or it might be 1,500 a month. Okay. So it really just depends on what you think your future earning potential is gonna be what your plans are after you drop traveling as to what makes sense. Yeah, and so I think this is, is the situation where it would be helpful for you to run the numbers yourself or work with a financial advisor who can help you to run those numbers. What about, I know in the past we talked about with a lot of people it would make sense that they take advantage of an income driven repayment plan while they're traveling, but then maybe when they stop traveling they just plan to pay them off completely. Does that still make sense for a lot of people? Yeah, I, I think that is a situation that could really make sense. So let's say while you're traveling, you know that this is basically gonna be an interest-free loan. Let's say you travel for five years, you put all that extra money that you're saving into either investments or something maybe safer, a savings account, CDs, bonds, something like that. And then when you stop traveling, you just put all of that money towards your loans and get rid of them. So you basically had five years of interest-free loan while your money grew or compounded for you and then you got rid of it after you stopped traveling. Or you travel all that whole time and then you switch to a 10-year repayment plan and uh, just pay it down over 10 years with some of that money that you've saved. So I think that can make sense. Um, I think there's very few situations where you'll be way worse off on save versus going on pay as you earn or something like that for travelers. But there are going to be situations where you would be worse off and you need to think about it ahead of time. So question, um, when you said that you won't be able to switch off of the save after five years once you're on it, does that mean you won't be able to switch to a different income driven repayment plan, but you could still switch to like standard 10 year or just pay them off? After the, the five years? Them? Yeah. Um, so I didn't see any conclusive, anything written about that yet. Okay. I, I think, I mean, so the, the thing about it is you can always pay them off quickly. You can right. always make always higher payments. Option. Yeah. Right. So if you wanted to just pretend like you're on a 10 year standard repayment, look up what your payment amount would be and just make that payment while you're still on save, you can do that. So it's not like you could ever be stuck, you know what I mean? Like right. you can always pay it off quicker if you want. So um, it's mainly just you can't change to another income driven payment plan. Okay. And with again, different terms. this is the current way that it's proposed. This could always change, something else could come along, but um, you yeah. definitely need to make decisions based on what's currently going on and then go from there. Yeah, and if anybody watching this has questions, feel free to ask because I know it's confusing. Um, trying to explain it, um, as simply as you can, but there's so many acronyms and, and things, it's almost impossible to explain uh, really in depth and really simply. Yeah, I, I always tell Jared, we, 
We talk about on, on um, we were walking back, uh, we're in Airbnb in Denmark right now. We were walking back earlier talking about the video and everything and I was like, well, you know, the best part about when we do these videos together is you understand this stuff really in depth, but I can kind of be your common listener who I haven't really studied it or learned it the way you have. So I can be like, hold up, wait, what is it that you mean? And try to explain it a little bit more simply. Yeah. But at the same time, I've learned a lot over the years too. So I know sometimes I, I may not be the best judge of what makes sense and what doesn't if you're brand new to this. Yeah. And these questions Whitney's asking, these aren't like stage questions. These are just no, questions. No, I really just asked. don't know. Yeah. Um, it's funny, actually, you know, we're on our honeymoon right now for 10 weeks. We've obviously been very busy leading up to our wedding and then immediately going on this trip. And I have a running to-do list of things. And literally when we get back, I have on my own to-do list, decide what to do about my student loans before they go back into the repayment. I just checked my student loan servicer today before the video and my first payment is due October 15th. So I need to be like, uh, wait, are we actually, are we doing the safe plan or, you know, run my situation and make sure like, does it make sense or should I be doing pay as you earn? Um, yeah. we, we still need to like make for certain, we're pretty sure we're going to do save, uh, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, not hundred percent certain yet. So we still have to do that ourselves. Yep. Okay. So, so the negatives, there's one more negative. So the, the first two, just to recap, uh, you can't switch after five years and your payments aren't capped. So if you have really high income, that can be a major issue. Uh, the last negative um, is that now, like I said, this plan is replacing repay. And it's also, it's basically it's gonna introduce more uncertainty into what the future of these plans will be. Because if you can just suddenly replace a plan with another plan, or you can just suddenly change the terms on a plan that people are already in, it's kind of unprecedented to do that. So this kind of opens a whole new can of worms of what changes will there be in the future. Let's say someone gets in office, a new president, and we're going through some really tough financial times. And they're like, well, why are all these students being able to make zero dollar payments? Uh, we need to change this. It should be zero percent of the federal poverty line. And that would increase everybody's payment. And that's something that could happen now because you know, just as easily as this changed from 150% to 225%, they could say, no, you shouldn't have any discretionary income. It should be 0% of the poverty line, and any money you have should be your discretionary income. Like, those types of changes could happen now if this goes through, because it just shows that anything can be modified, um, basically spur of the moment, or whoever the president is can just decide that things can change. So I don't really like that uncertainty either. And um, I think that's a negative that I haven't really seen that many people talking about, but that is something that people need to consider is that now these rules are going to be malleable. Things might change year to year. Uh, every time a new president comes in, they might change the poverty line or they might change the forgiveness terms or, you know, things like that. Yeah. But I also think that that was the big argument for a lot of people over the years that kind of, um, argued against what, you doing this. They were like, you know, the government can change anything at any time. These income driven repayment plans could go away. Um, the way they tax it, like the tax bill at the end, there's just so much uncertainty. And so for a lot of reasons, a lot of people always just said, pay them off, don't rely on these plans, why would you rely on the government, blah, blah, But I think also your argument was always that they were probably not gonna make it more harsh. If anything, they would probably lean in the direction of making it more lenient. Because, okay, we're in a situation, and we've always said it's like, well, so what, I guess we'll just pay them off, like we're in a good financial position. Um, we've done really well to save money and all this stuff. People always say like, aren't you worried about the tax bill at the end? And we're like, no, we've been saving like 75% or more of our income just for our own purposes. Like we're not worried about the tax bill at the end. We've but, got multiples and multiples of that. But with that said, like we are the top like financial savvy people, right? So if, if they went back on these financial, um, or sorry, these income driven repayment plans, people who are way worse off financially are going to default on their loans. Like they're just not going to be able to pay them. So I don't think that the government is going to make it more strict. I think they're going to go in the direction of making it more lenient. So if you look at the history of financial plans, student loan plans, different financial programs, government programs over the years, really rarely do things go in the negative direction. It almost always gets easier. And that makes sense or gets more lenient. And that makes sense because all these are elected officials, right? So if they're doing things that make a certain portion of their electorate angry, then they lose votes. So yeah, I would say the odds of it getting significantly worse, not real great. And that's, that was my argument all the way back then when people, yeah, they were saying, well, what if they get rid of forgiveness and all that? It's like, 
once all these people are on these plans, they're not going to get rid of forgiveness. They're not going to say, oh, sorry, you know, never mind, we're not going to do that now. All these people would be really angry. And uh, I think, yeah, probably the odds of there being negative changes are low, but this definitely opens the door more than ever for there to be negative changes. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, if you have questions, if you are watching live, leave those in the comments. If you're watching later on Facebook, you can feel free to leave them in the comments or on YouTube. Um, if you're listening on the podcast, just feel free to send us an email or a message if you have questions. Um, just to summarize everything, student loans are going back into repayment, supposedly. As of September, they, the pause will end. You'll have a payment due in October. Mine, personally, is due October 15th. I just checked my student loan servicer. It's a really important time right now for you to be assessing your financial situation, be logging into your student loan servicer, look at your loan balance, decide which plan you're gonna go on. If you need help with that, we really recommend that you consult with a financial advisor, um, such as Fitbucks, they have a lot of great tools and they're really adept at talking to healthcare professionals about your choices. Um, for a lot of you, it's gonna make sense just to go on either your standard 10-year repayment plan or try to aggressively pay them off as quickly as possible. If you are a traveler who's watching this, um, we've known tons of travelers that just took advantage of making higher income as a traveler, get that paid off as quickly as possible. We could have done that. We could have paid off our student loans within like two years yeah, two of traveling. Years. Um, Jared had about 95,000 or so, and I had about 160,000. 140. I think I just checked today that the principal is at 160. That's what it is now, yeah. But when oh. you started, it was 140. Okay, so 140,000. Um, could have paid that off within two years, but chose not to. Um, you know, we are going a different route financially. And for some of you, we, we get a lot more people asking about this than you'd think. And a lot of you are like, you guys are crazy finance people. Like, I'm not gonna do this. We get messages and questions all the time. There's a lot of people really getting into the financial independence movement and looking more in depth into their finances and how to optimize it. Um, there's a lot of really geeky, mathy people out there that are really into this stuff. So if you are one of those people, maybe you can run the numbers to yourself. Yeah, Derek gets messages all the time like, hey man, I really relate with you. Um, a lot of times it's male therapists, not always, but I do think that there's probably a lot of like male therapists that easily could have gone a different route in life where they were like an accountant or just had engineer more... Engineer or something. Yeah, like engineer, that. like had more of a mathy brain like Jared. Jared definitely could have been an accountant or something. Me, I'm not into that sort of thing I'm like uh, what <laughs> but um, anyway if this is something you want to optimize you can definitely look into it um, for some of you the save plan will make a lot of sense for some of you pay as you earn will make a lot of sense yep yeah overall the changes seem positive you just have to really think more about your future now than you did in the past just because the option to switch off of this plan is going to go away so the main deadline for making the choice is July 2024 when pay as you earn is supposedly going to no longer be available to um, sign up for. So if pay as you earn is something that might work better for your situation, you just need to decide between now and July of 2024. And unless that changes, you know, things are always in flux with this. I mean, it could be a year from now they say, never mind, or we're going to keep pay as you earn, we're going to keep all the plans, we're going to keep repay, we're going to just add this plan. That, that might be something that happens. So you never know, but if you want to be on pay as you earn and that makes sense for your situation after traveling, then that's something you want to think about now. And uh, yeah, I think who save really makes sense for it, that is just like a, a major blessing for anybody that is going down a similar route to us. Anybody that's really financially savvy that wants to go from traveling and use that as like a springboard into semi-retirement or early retirement or part-time work or something like that where you're never going to have a really high income, save is amazing. You, you're going to have a low payment forever. You're going to have no accrued interest. And eventually after 25 years, you get to forgiveness. So that is almost a no brainer for anybody that is planning to go some sort of route like we did. Um, for anybody that plans to go into like more of the corporate world and move up and be a, a regional manager and an area manager and vice president of a company, like then your payment's going to probably increase a lot because you're going to be earning a lot more money. So then you need to consider things a little more thoroughly now and determine if, okay, maybe not having this payment cap doesn't make sense, and maybe 20 years of forgiveness would be better, or maybe paying off my loans quickly makes sense. So just think about those things now. Yeah, and just a little note I had here, which I think is obvious, but I want to hammer home the point. If you decide to take advantage of these student loan um, forgiveness, or, or sorry, income-driven repayment plans, while you're a traveler, it should be because you're choosing to take that money and do something good with it instead, like invest. 
further your financial future, not just because you want to have a low payment so you can blow a lot of extra money while you travel. Like that obviously is an option, but we think that you should be pursuing this option because you're trying to improve your finances and you're trying to save a lot of money in the long run. Um, and that's how we've used Travel Therapy to our advantage. For those that may not be as familiar with us, we only worked full time for three years as travelers and we saved 75 to 90% of our income during those three years. And we put a lot into investments so much that if we kept a really um, uh, minimal, like, frugal minimal lifestyle. lifestyle for the rest of our lives, that we could live for the rest of our lives just on our investments that we have now. Um, now, that's not necessarily the case. We still plan to earn some income, some part-time work. Um, you know, we have our online business, and we still plan to earn some income, and you know, that way we can have a little bit nicer lifestyle. We're not just only going to live on this. Um, investments that we made the first three years, but yeah, like you can do it. You can invest really aggressively while you're a traveler if you're taking advantage of one of these income driven repayment plans and get yourself in a really great financial position for the future. Back before we started traveling, we thought, okay, we'll travel for like five years, like your typical traveler, and then just settle into a permanent job. Like that's just what you do. You move back home, you buy a house, you get a permanent job, you work 40 hours a week. But after a few years, it became evident to us we wouldn't have to ever do that. And it's not just because we have an online business, like, Regardless of whether we had this or not, we could have gone into a part-time or just PRN type work environment because of the investments and the savings that we had the first three years. And because we live in a relatively low cost living area back home. Yeah, uh, that really true. helps. So if you're if you're somebody from Southern California, that's gonna be difficult. New York. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so hopefully this was helpful, um, at least in giving you some ideas about what what's happening with this new safe plan, what's happening with student loans. But you're definitely going to need to do some further research on your own, do some more planning, um, consult a financial advisor if you're not comfortable with doing it on your own. Yep. Um, I think the safe plan is going to be great. I think there's a lot of people that are, uh, a lot of travelers that have messaged me already over just like the last three or four months since this was announced and they're like, this plan's amazing. It's going to be so good. Uh, every traveler's going to go on it. And I, I do think that's true, but I do want to... Uh, temper expectations a little bit and point out some of the potential downsides. Um, I do think that overall this is a, a very positive thing if if it's not challenged and overturned in court like that ten and 20000 of forgiveness was. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I would say there's a pretty good chance it'll be challenged as, as far as being overturned. I, I kind of doubt it because for it to be overturned in court, there has to be someone that has to prove that they're in a worse position based on these changes. Usually that's the way it works. They have to have some sort of precedent that shows that they were impacted negatively from these changes. And there's not a lot of like immediate negative impact you could show from this. Payments are lower, there's no accrued interest, like most of the things are better. It's just um, that change that you can't switch off the plan that is, is going to cause some more um, thought to be put into it and more calculations that need to be done. Yeah. So overall, it sounds like it's gonna be a good option for someone who's like us, who plans to travel for a while and then go into a semi-retirement or early retirement scenario where you're only working part-time, or somebody who plans to just take advantage of it only while they're traveling, and then as soon as they get done traveling, probably pay the loans off completely instead of riding it out over the whole 25 years. Um, if that's not you, if you think that you're somebody who is going to travel for a couple of years and then go into a more of a permanent 40 hour a week, higher incoming scenario, higher income scenario, Save as your may not be a good choice for you. Yep. Wait, what did you say? Save as your own? Save. 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 <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was thinking, it's, it I was about, for... I, think, I think what I was going to say is pay as you earn might be the better choice for you, not save. Yeah. Save actually stands for saving on a valuable education, which is kind of a weird acronym to have the acronym as the same as the first, the first word. word. Yeah, I thought the same thing. But uh, they were, I guess they were desperate to make it sound good, so they're like, that's what they came up when with. When they saving. came up, they like the four and the five letter, like yeah. pay, the P-A-Y-E, -P pay, repay, whatever. All right, so hopefully this was educational. Hopefully you learned something. If it was, um, please hit that thumbs up button. We would appreciate it if you would like this video, tag a friend or share it with somebody who could use this information. Yep. Let us know if you have any questions. Also, keep an eye out for that article. If you want to see how this, this whole like, oh, go on an income-driven repayment plan and invest instead, how that actually works in real life and, and what the results are, keep an eye out for that article. The results surprised me. I mean, I was ahead by 20,000 after three and a half years, but to be ahead by 120,000 after eight years, I did the calculations over and over because I thought I was wrong. I was like, what am I missing? There's no way this is right. I only started with 90,000 in loans. How can my net worth be 120,000 higher than it would have been if I paid off the debt quickly? But that's the power of 
investment returns being higher than your, uh, your student loan interest rate. And so something to consider. Definitely not for everybody, but it can work out really well. And it's obviously worked out very well for us. So keep an eye out for that article. I've got all the math and all the calculations in there so you can see how it works. Yeah, we'll be publishing that probably next Sunday. So next weekend, um, keep an eye out on our page for that article. Um, it's called like 120000 ahead after eight years on an income driven recruitment plan. So Jerry goes over all the math on that. Yep. And then one other thing we're doing a giveaway right now on Instagram. So give away an Apple Watch. Go over there if you're interested. Follow us on Instagram. And um, also end of the year giveaway. We're going to do an end of the year giveaway way again so um, if you've taken a contract with one of our companies fill out our contract completion form and we just ask for some feedback about the recruiters we sent you to the companies we sent you to how the contract went any feedback that you have about the recruiters that helps us with our processes and um, at the end of the year we'll be giving away a thousand dollars in gift cards for people that fill out that form yeah. so go to what is it What's yep that? so if you if if you're listening and you have taken a job with one of the recruiters that we recommended to you, either from our recruiter recommendation form or a hot jobs form, and you're looking for the form for you to fill out for the giveaway, just go to our website at traveltherapymentor.com and on the menu, click giveaway, and you can fill out the form right there. We'll also be sending it out in our newsletter. So if you're on our email list, you'll get it in the newsletter. Um, if you don't know what we're talking about, if you'd like help getting connected with some recruiters that we recommend, you can fill out our recruiter recommendation form or check out our hot jobs list and fill out the hot jobs form for one of the jobs. We'll connect you with one of the recruiters that we recommend. If you end up taking a job with them, um, then you can qualify for the end of the year giveaway. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully that made sense. I know it's probably confusing. Like I said, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments or send us a message and I'll do my best to explain things uh, whatever I whatever I messed up on or whatever I didn't make very clear, I'll try to explain it better. Yep. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys in a couple weeks when we're back home. Yep. All right. Have a good night. Take care. Bye.